you hear us talk a lot about books and records, books and records, books and records. So Andy and I were talking, we're like, why don't we go back to basics and just talk about bookkeeping 101 and how to keep good books and records in your business. In today's economy, more people than ever are looking to buy and sell businesses. But how do you do it? Welcome to The Deal Board, presented by Transworld Business Advisors. Straight talk about real deals and real people. Listen to stories, interviews, and expert advice to help your business sale, merger, or acquisition process. Now, here are your business exit experts, Andy and Jessica. Welcome back, everybody. And today, uh, we've got an interesting episode. So you hear us talk a lot about books and records, books and records, books and records. So Andy and I were talking, we're like, why don't we go back to basics and just talk about bookkeeping 101 and how to keep good books and records in your business? Um, and we're really excited. We're joined by two experts in this field. Andy, who did you interview for the, this episode? Uh, yeah, the, back to basics and how do you keep good books and records? Max Emma from bookskeeping.com, I think is, is the website. He has, not only does he have a company, Bookskeeping, which is B-O-X, keeping. Um, he has a company, it's also a franchise. So there's two opportunities there. Number one, you could hire his company to help you keep your QuickBooks on a monthly basis. And it's very inexpensive. That's the amazing thing about uh, technology today and, and being able to post things online and being able to access bank accounts online. These companies could work in the background for very, very little money and keep your QuickBooks and your business up to date. He works with all different kinds of uh, platforms, as you'll hear. And then on top of it, if you are a person looking to buy a business, you call Transworld. We'll help you hook up with bookskeeping.com. And you could open up your own franchise. And it's he does the bookkeeping for many franchises across the country. He continues to grow because franchisors, of course, want their franchisees to keep good books and records so they get paid. And he is, his business is exploding and it's a great story. So uh, it's a great interview and you interviewed. Yeah. And I interviewed Greg Crabtree who uh, literally has written the book on bookkeeping. Um, so Greg is a CPA by trade. He owns and founded his own firm, Crabtree, Row and Berger. Um, but he's also the best-selling author of Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits. It's one of the top books I recommend for entrepreneurs. It's Simple. Um, that's why the title Simple Numbers. And he also contributed to Vern Harnish's Scaling Up in the Cash section. So um, literally like one of the best gurus on bookkeeping for small businesses. Um, and he's done it in his practice on the Gulf Coast for years and years and years. So we talk about some of the metrics that he likes to um, keep on the different clients that he works on how to simplify the PL and look at the PL from an entrepreneurial perspective of just like what are the metrics that you should be watching um, and how do you make that simple so you can understand it as an owner, but you can also communicate it to your leadership team or stakeholders, get everybody on the same page and tracking the same metrics too. So it's it's a great episode. I mean, just again, like you said, getting back to the basics and understanding what it means when we say, hey, please keep good books and records. This is going to tell you. Yeah, we say that a lot. So I'm glad about 155 episodes in now we're finally <laughs> explaining it. So exactly. we hope you get a lot of takeaways. It's a very tactical episode. And um, as always, if you have any questions or anything for us, you can reach out to us at thedealboardpodcast.com. Yeah, let's get to it. This is a good one. Transworld Business Advisors is the world's largest business brokerage and mergers and acquisitions firm with over 500 brokers in nearly 200 offices worldwide. Transworld's team handles thousands of business sales every year. To be connected with a qualified business broker or learn more about the buying and selling process, visit tworld.com forward slash the deal board or call 888-719-9098. Hey, welcome back, everybody. And I am very happy to have a special guest, Max Emma, who's a friend of the firm. Uh, Max has been working with our folks out in California for a while, and he has a great company called Bookkeeping. But I'm going to let uh, Max basically introduce himself and let him tell you a little bit about what he does, because it's right on the nose of what we're talking about today which is keeping good books and records and what does that look like? So Max, welcome. 
give us a little bit of background about your business and how you got involved. Sounds great, Andy. Thank you for the opportunity. So the company is named Bookskeeping. It's Bookkeeping with an X. And we provide remote bookkeeping solutions to small, medium-sized businesses uh, throughout the United States. We have clients in all 50 states, but majority of the work we do is for the franchise brands. So right now, Bookskeeping is the preferred bookkeeping vendor for over 80 franchise brands, including all of the United Franchise Group uh, brands, including Transworld. We have some of your uh, franchisees as our clients, which is great. And a few years ago, that gave me an idea, crazy idea that I can be a franchisor. So on top of providing accounting solutions, we now sell bookkeeping uh, franchises in all states. We have five. The fifth one was actually signed today. So uh, it's a great day for me today. So we have uh, some in Florida, Texas, and California, and the goal is to sell 10 more before the end of this year. That's great. I mean, uh, being a franchisor is a, is a big responsibility, as you know, but you have a very successful model, and that's what it takes. You start with the successful model, and then you you know give that opportunity to other people. So I know you have a very successful model, and it's because you know what you're doing when keeping good books and records and to franchisors, of course, they want to make sure that their franchisees are keeping good books and records for several reasons. Number one, they want to get paid royalties. Number two is they want their franchisees to be successful. And number three is for us as business brokers, we want people to keep good books and records. So when they go to sell, it's easy to try to figure out how much money everybody makes. And so we keep telling people over and over again for the last 25 years I've been doing this, you have to keep book, good books and records. And it's easier than ever to do that. But tell us what does that look like? What, you know, you could number one, uh, tell us what a business should be doing and then tell them what books keeping does to help people do that. So First of all, I think a business, any business, needs to have some kind of record keeping. You know, they can choose later if they want to use QuickBooks, if they want to use Zero, if they want to use a piece of paper, but it has to be done. And it has to be done um, on a monthly basis at least. I mean, I would suggest that some businesses have to do it on a weekly uh, basis. Having said that, a lot of businesses just think that the purpose of bookkeeping is for them to file taxes, which I argue uh, how do you know if you're successful or not? How do you know if you made money or lost money? And the answer I get, well, I have money in my checking account. And that just completely, my mind goes, you know, ballistic. I'm like, that doesn't mean anything. How many bills do you have to pay? I mean, you and you understand, uh, obviously, that doesn't mean anything. But a lot of business owners, unfortunately, measure their success by the amount of money in the checking account. Um, yeah, that's... That's the simple man's balance sheet, as I call it. They'll, they log in the morning and they look to see how much is the bank account. That's not a good way to do this. Yes, absolutely. And that's where we come in. And we just pretty much just making it easy for uh, our clients. We, we tell them that, hey, if you work with bookkeeping, you don't have to ever log in into your QuickBooks. We suggest for you to do so because QuickBooks is a powerful tool and you can get a lot out of it, but you know you don't have to because we'll provide you financial statements every month. You will get your financials by the end of the following months at the latest, where you know your balance sheet, your income statement, your trial balance, you know exactly what's going on with your company. And that will allow you to make uh, decisions. I mean, you can see if the advertisement you ran last month is actually successful. And if it is, double down on it. If it's not working, stop it and put money somewhere else. If you wait 12 months to decide that, it's too late. You can't bring this money back. Yeah, I, I think timely reports are essential in, in business. And, you know, uh, I can't tell you how many times we show up to a business and they've never balanced their their bank account. They never reconciled their, their bank accounts. And so what's in the bank has no, it doesn't even match what's in the computers. So for sure, so you do all that, right? Absolutely. We do all the reconciliations. We do all the financial statements. And also uh, for all of our clients, we have a special paragraph saying uh, the communication with your CPA is unlimited, which means when the tax season comes, they don't have to be the middle person. We talk to a CPA directly, it's accountant to accountant. If they have a question for us, 
or they want us to make adjustments, they just call our office or they email my staff and that gets done right away. Everything we do is fixed fee. So there is no additional money for our clients for doing that. That's great. I mean, I no wonder everybody wants to use you because I, I again, it's, it's, it's not as easy back in the day, everybody kept a checkbook and that's where most of the payments got made. And then everybody made deposits in the bank and that's where most of the deposits came from. But that's not the case anymore. Things are, you know, being spent on recurring revenues on PayPal or things are going through other uh, che uh, credit cards and money's coming wired in and money's being automatically deposited. It's a lot more complicated this and you need it in one place, right? Absolutely. And as much as I love QuickBooks, for example, because we are partnering with them and we do a lot of work with QuickBooks, we actually, uh, you know, solution partner for Intuit for all the franchise systems in the United States. But I think they killed the accounting business in a way because they made people believe that they can do bookkeeping themselves only if they have a, a QuickBooks subscription, which is absolutely not true. You can learn how to enter your data but if you don't understand debits, credits, balance sheet, and income statement, you can make a lot of mistakes. And these mistakes can be very costly for you. For example, you put your own money into the company for whatever reason, you know, like a loan to the company. If you just make one small mistake and put it as an income, at the end of the year, it'll show that you have to pay taxes on it. But in fact, this is just a balance sheet item, which, you know, you pretty much going to be paying back to yourself at some point. That's like the simplest example I can give. Yeah, no, it's a great example because we I tell that to all my brokers all the time. You know, here we are and we're speaking and we're about halfway through 2023. And uh, what happens a lot of times is we'll get interim statements from these from business owners where they just print out or, you know, email us a QuickBooks report. But th that QuickBooks has not been looked at and will not per be perhaps looked at by a CPA until the end of the year. And they're not making any balance sheet uh, adjustments, whether it's bad debt or accounts receivables or inventory adjustments, because the inventory is exactly what it was in you know, December 31st when they entered it the last time and didn't count all the way through. They, you know, or like you said, they're they're making payments toward loans or they're or they're putting you know they're borrowing money and they don't account for it correctly and their quickbooks is far from the truth absolutely and we see that all the time and um luckily when we work with franchise brands they make it mandatory from franchisees to provide the financials on monthly or quarterly basis so at least this pushes the franchisee to hire bookkeeping or somebody else or try to do it themselves yeah, and it's not so simple as you put it, uh, keeping good books and records out there. And so QuickBooks is one you mentioned. The other one was zero. Yeah, zero, which spelled X E R O, um, and it's also an online platform. It used to be pretty big in the U.S., but uh, into it now took over the U.S. market completely for the small businesses. So zero is really big in Australia and New Zealand. We also work with Netsuite. We work with Sage Intact. So we don't discriminate. Any accounting software is good for us. Right, right. And and so are you seeing more and more businesses go to more electronic kind of payments and uh, inventory systems and point of sale systems? Absolutely. I mean, there is not too many companies that are doing it manually anymore. Uh, and there are a lot, a lot of big players, but they're also small uh, players that are just unique for a particular industry. So I just tell them when you choose a POS or point of sale or CRM, make sure that this system talks to the accounting software, for example, uh, QuickBooks, because there are some uh, software still don't have a bridge with QuickBooks, which means somebody has to manually transfer the data into QuickBooks, which takes time. And it actually has a risk of making an error. Right, right. And then, and again, uh, you know, as I've seen in in these in, in many companies over the years, if you make one mistake and you don't take care of it for many many years, uh, it's very difficult to unwind. Like when somebody mismanages their inventory or 
you know, is is trying to do things to save on taxes, uh, they 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 will, you know, basically uh, their books are really you can't unwind that, especially if they do it year after year. Yeah, because it builds on it. And then we, it's like a Pandora box. We have to open it and just go back and we don't know what we're going to find. So um, and that can be very costly. Uh, in this case, is bookkeeping, for example, charges hourly because I tell clients, I have no idea what we're going to find. Right. So it's, it's almost like, say, okay, fine. I filed the taxes for last year. I'm more or less comfortable. I don't want to go back. Let's start January 1st. Because if they say we want to fix it from the beginning, I'm like, it can be thousands of dollars because we don't know what we're going to find. Right. So the best thing, the best advice everybody can have is when they buy a business to make sure they hire you <laughs> to make sure that they have a company like you that starts right from the beginning. Uh, absolutely. And from personal experience, Andy, since uh, you in the brokerage uh, industry, when somebody buys a new company, start brand new QuickBooks Zero, whatever file you're starting, don't build on the existing file. Keep it for the records, just so you can, for the references, so you can go back and see, you know, one or another transaction, but start brand new file. A lot of people make a mistake. They just continue on and the old trash that been sitting there for decades, it's just passing through and it just creates bigger problems. So my advice, always start a brand new uh, accounting software file. That's that that is great advice. That was worth uh, the interview right there. Everybody listening, uh, when you start a new company, uh, you know, or even a new division, or you know, or you, I mean, you start, you but you buy a new company. Don't take their old QuickBooks. Um, you know, start a brand new, and 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 that's like you said, you could always adjust the beginning balances for all these things and your chart of accounts and. And uh, you know you could even you could even import them, but if if it has a whole mess behind there, it it, it makes it very very difficult to unwind. Absolutely. So, so talk about like what business owners, if they were going to use your service, what does that look like on a daily basis? Where how do they interface with you? Uh, you give them access to your the, you know their banking records and stuff, and everything happens behind the scenes, or do you have a monthly call with them? How does that work? So at a minimum, we provide monthly uh, financial statements. And the way I train my team is the less we talk to a client, the more efficient we are. So you're not going to hear from us on a daily basis or even weekly basis. If you're a monthly client, once a month, we're going to download all your transactions, let's say, into QuickBooks Online from checking accounts and the credit card accounts. And by the way, we only have access to uh, view and download. We cannot transact. Otherwise, we just will not take a client. We have right. I don't know, close to 500 clients and we don't have access, full access to a single client, okay? So right. we're going to download it directly into QuickBooks. We're going to reconcile it and then send um, a, a franchisee or business owner uh, financial statements, preliminary with the list of questions. Hey, what's ABC Consulting? What's Amazon? Because that could be anything. We will not be asking questions about every transaction that took place, okay? If we sure. see Shell gas station, we assume it's gasoline. If they got themselves a six pack of beer, good for them. But <laughs> unless it's important, we're not going to bother because otherwise, and that's what old school bookkeeping companies are doing, Andy. I'm not criticizing. I'm just seeing it. And sure. that's why they charge outrageous amounts because they look at every receipt. For me, it's a waste of uh, time and waste of resources. Okay. If something is out of the ordinary and it's important for you as a business owner, simply tell us. We'll gladly move it and put it in the right bucket. And then we're done for the months and we give them an opportunity to schedule uh, you know, a call. Not everybody takes this opportunity, but they have this option to talk to one of my seniors staff and then we're done for the month we can build on it we can pay bills we can create invoices we can actually do financial statements on a weekly basis we have some clients that we work for on a daily basis but they are obviously yeah. larger clients and right. uh, we do some books for some franchisors and we do all the royalty collection so we are all over the place but our bread and butter are smaller businesses where we come in once a month let's say come in it's of course remotely and we provide them financial statements, even though I, I, I've been saying that remotely. But now that we sell bookkeeping franchises, the local franchisees are actually uh, go to some businesses in person and meet with the business owners in, let's say, Miami or San Diego. All right. That's that's very interesting. And tell us about 
the franchise opportunity. So, you know, tell, you know, I have someone say in uh, Tennessee or Connecticut, that's thinking about a franchise and, you know, tell, tell, tell us what it would be like to buy a bookskeeping franchise. So bookskeeping franchise, it's, we learned so much in the past 11, 12 years. And a lot of the things we learned, you know, using our own dollars and wasted some time because, you know, you don't know everything. At least I didn't. And I learned a lot of things. And then we realized, hey, we know a lot. How do we pass on this information? And that's when the idea of a bookskeeping franchise was born. So bookskeeping franchise is a home-based opportunity. So you don't have to have an office. Uh, we provide two weeks training. And then on top of that, for the next six months, they get sales training with the live sales trainer, and they get one year of executive coaching, something that usually costs them five to $7,000 a month. They get it for free because my co-founder, Elena Emma, she's actually you know, a psychologist and she has a PhD. So we just provide it to all our employees and our franchisees as additional service, which makes them better uh, business owners and better people ultimately. Of course, we're not going to make them do that, but if they want to, they have this opportunity at no additional charge. And then um, they get 900 pages of brand manual, which is pretty much instructions how to do everything. Uh, every form, anything, every script that possibly they can use, we provide it to them. We also can provide them staff to do the work. So really all they have to do, they just have to get uh, new clients. But I almost sound like, you know, a knife uh, salesperson, but wait, there is more. If uh, if they want to get more clients, we can help with that as well. As I mentioned in the beginning, we are preferred bookkeeping vendor for 80 franchise brands. So, and this number is growing. So let's say new Sinarama, which is our client, is opening in Miami. They, our franchisee, get an introduction to this French uh, Sinarama franchisee. As soon as they sign the um, franchise agreement, before they put a sign on the door, before the competition even knows that the store is going to be open there. So they can contact them and say, hey, we are preferred vendor and talk to them. And the price has been pre-negotiated and it's a very easy sales. That's, I mean, listen, I, I love business to business sales. I like franchises that, uh, you, you know, you can do from home like this, and that is providing a professional service. Uh, you know, you're not uh, baking cupcakes or, and not, nothing wrong with baking cupcakes, but you know, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's, it's a lot of manual hard work. This is, um, you know, there's a lot of people out there that have been uh, gone to business school that this would be a great uh, opportunity opportunity for. Uh, and, you know, if you're an, even if you're an accountant and you wanted to, leave your big accounting firm and have your own business. Uh, consider bookskeeping. I think that would be a great, you know, a, a great opportunity. And so, and there's plenty of territory open, right? Well, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we have five and, you know, we give half million people a population as a territory, which means uh, there are plenty of opportunities. But even though somebody gets a protected territory to get a referral to, let's say, sign that I'm a franchisee using it as an example but um you know if they have a cousin who lives in Boston for example they have a French uh the franchise uh, bookkeeping franchise in Miami they can take any clients from their cousin they can right. directly go and market in Boston because we might right. have a franchisee but they go where the referral is it's almost yeah. like you know your uh model is transport you know there is a relationship comes from a different place they your brokers can take that Yep. And it works out very well. And there's, a, I will tell you, uh, just from my side of the world, having visited thousands upon thousands of businesses, looked at all their tax returns, looked at their QuickBooks, there is a huge need out there in the world for bookkeeping and uh, Max's uh, professionals. And on top of it, uh, it is becoming more and more, more difficult uh, to keep track of your books and records because of so many things like electronic payments and, and just keeping track of all that. Things are happening much faster and uh, you need that data as quickly as possible. And having Max and uh, his team uh, behind you is, is, is I, I think, a great idea for any for any business. Right? You know, forget whether or not they're a franchise. Um, if you want good bookkeeping, you know, uh, as we say, 
everybody, please have good books and records out there. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, very valuable and it'll, it'll prove to be valuable when you go to sell your business too. 100%. Yeah. So Max, any final thoughts as we're uh, wrapping up? Um, just wanted to mention whether your uh, viewers and listeners would be interested in bookkeeping or bookkeeping franchise. There is no money we charge for a consultation or for a conversation. I love meeting new people, you know, so just, just give me a call. Let's chat. I mean, it might not be a good match today, but you might know somebody or, you know, you might come back in three, four months and just say, you know what, now I need your services. Or maybe you're thinking about opening a business, a different business. And you just want to know, Hey, what's my involvement going to be with a bookkeeping firm? How much money is it going to cost me? How much time am I going to spend? Just, you know, have a conversation. I mean, uh, it's easy to find us. Add me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'll be happy to speak to uh, people. And then if I'm not available, somebody from my team will be able to do so. That's exactly what the last question was going to be to you is what's the best way to get in touch with you? So LinkedIn, uh, you want to give your website out? You can. Yes, absolutely. The website is bookskeeping.com. It's like it says on the top, it's B-O-X-K-E-P-I-N-G, bookskeeping.com. Or if you're interested in franchise, it's bookskeepingfranchise.com. Uh, if maybe you can put some links uh, we on, will on put the bottom. Links in, inside everything and, uh, and link to you. And uh, if you're listening, yeah, folks, uh, reach out to Max. He's a great guy, obviously willing to help anybody in business. And willing to answer questions. So I really Absol appreciate it. Absolutely. Appreciate it and, uh, and there is no too many Max Emma's. So if you Google Max Emma, you will get to me one, one way or another. So just, just like Andy Cagnetto, it's not too absolutely. many. Emma's. That's absolutely. good. Thanks so much, Max, for coming in today. Really, really appreciate it. Same here. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate that. Hey, Andy, do you know what time it is? It's time for our deal of the week. Deal of the week. Sold. Hey, welcome back, everybody. It is Deal of the Week, and I have Wendy Conway here from St. Louis. And so you just closed a very nice deal. Tell yes. me about it. Yes, we did. Our office closed. We had an automotive center for sale. We listed it. Um, three months later, had a contract on it. Yeah, buyer and seller worked very well together. They're, you know, their relationship was really good. And we closed it six months later and it was 1.3 million. Was wow. Our biggest deal. Wow. Very yeah, nice. So. Was it making a lot of money? Yes. Yes. Do you remember how much what the SD is? I do is? not. I don't, I don't remember the numbers, but the... It sold for a pretty good multiple, obviously. Sounds like a very established place, 1.3. Yes. Was the yes. real estate included as well? There was real estate included. Excellent. Uh -huh. And it was a family business. So okay. it had been, you know, going and... And it was funny. I told Bill, we went to closing and the two owners had their... Uh, mechanics outfits on with grease on it. Right. So it was a whole group of us, so we got a really nice picture, but it just showed like a family business, and you know, they were all really happy. So. Nice. And was the buyer a young person? Uh, buyer was um, not real young, but he had already purchased a few automotive okay, shops. Okay, so it, this was an so, add on for yeah, him, right? An add on. Excellent. So, yeah. so it sounds like good deals for good people. Yeah, absolutely. Did he finance it or did the sellers finance it? Um, no seller financing, and it was SBA. SBA loan. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, yeah. that sounds like a great deal for Absolutely. a business that wanted to expand, was able to expand using SBA loans. That's right. Imagine that. Sounds like a great deal, Wendy. Wendy, great. what's the best way to get in touch with you if somebody else wants to do another deal? Um, you'll call us at 636-544-8422. Uh, Excellent. Thank you for coming on. Congratulations. Great Thank deal. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. And this week on The Deal Board, you know we're talking about books and records and bookkeeping, one of mine and Andy's favorite topics to talk about, but we haven't really under uh, explained the importance of it um, from a micro issue. So I'm very excited today for my interview. I have Greg Crabtree joining me. Greg is a speaker, author, entrepreneur, and financial expert. Um, he has used his entrepreneurial skills to develop Crabtree Row and Burger, a firm that's focused solely on the needs of entrepreneurs, helping them build the economic engine of their businesses. He's worked with entrepreneurs all over the country in a broad range of industries, helping them simplify their financial reporting and empowering all of the entrepreneurs to take ownership of their finances. Um, he is a 
best-selling author of Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits, one of my favorite books to recommend, um, and has recently released the updated version of that book, Simple Numbers 2.0. Greg, welcome to the deal board. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Look forward to it. Yeah. So I gave everybody kind of a, a brief intro about who you are and what you do. Anything you'd like to add to that or perspective you'd like to give to our listeners? Yeah, that and, you know, I would say that I'm I'm a recovering accountant. Uh, you know, I endured learning the tools of the profession to say, you know, there's got to be a better way. Yeah, and uh, I think the accounting profession owes the world of entrepreneurs a, a mass apology. You know, for the grief and angst that we caused by what our profession thinks should happen, and we forgot the most important thing: the needs of the customer, the needs of the company. And so kind of my life work in the last 20 years has been built around this idea of what is it, what is the data that business owners who are successful, what do they look at? So the, you know, simple numbers, you know, really is not born out of my ideas. It's born out of me observing, you know, some of my best clients and, and getting in their head and saying, Hey, what, what did you look at? What, what made sense to you? And it really comes down to just a handful of numbers, not a not a lot. And you know, a lot of people that try to become professional with their numbers just kind of get overwhelmed with the data. And you know, they can have fancy dashboards, and you can have all of these you know metrics. And it's like you know, I I, I tell my clients all the time, if you'll follow our handful of three or four different metrics to look at, you'll never have to worry about a loan covenant in the rest of your life. You know, because it works. It, the, the loan covenants exist because people people are pushing the edges and they don't really know what they're doing. And and if you run the business in a healthy, sustainable way, creates value, creates sustainability. You know, creates value, and and those are the things that you're trying to accomplish. And um, you know, and and that kind of led to uh, in in to kind of update on on the bio. Uh, in 2020, I did merge my firm with a national firm, Car Riggs and Ingram, so we're part of a top 20 U.S. accounting firm. But my office unit is uh, Simple Numbers CRI, and and so um, so they we we still do the same thing we were doing before we merged. So it's it's just a, a matter of just being part of a broader broader network. Uh, and they like what we do because it's, you know, every CPA firm wants to do consulting. Well, we just happen to have a very targeted thing we do. And, uh, and, and be quite honest, it's really a lot more fun to help people create a profitable business than it is to do a tax return. Right? <laughs> that, that is very true. It's a lot more fun for the entrepreneur too to work yeah. with an accounting yeah. firm that's helping with profitability. Um, yeah. I mean, one of the things we were talking about in the green room before we jumped on is you know, we just tend to overcomplicate things as entrepreneurs right. and owners, right? And one of the topics you talk about in your book is, you know, why are your numbers lying to you? And in parentheses, you say, and why you are the cause. So let's yeah. talk a little bit about that. Like, what are the numbers that are lying to us as owners? And why is that the case? Yeah, so typically, you know, if you're a 5 to $10 million business and under uh, owner compensation and playing games of you you think you're doing things for taxes and yeah you might save a little bit of payroll tax but you do far more damage to the business psychologically you know about looking at incorrect numbers and so you give yourself this benefit of if you underpay yourself a salary take that that comp really via distribution or dividend you're you're lying to yourself and i i can't tell you how many times we have clients who tell themselves that they're profitable and i go no you're not you know, once you look at what you take out of the business to consume, not to invest in something, to consume that is a market that is reasonably close to a market-based wage for the job that you do, you know, in the business, you're not profitable. You're not meeting your minimum profitability standard. Uh, and and so, and and we've not missed on this. Every client that I've won the argument with to get them to pay themselves a market-based wage, not only did they make a higher salary, the company was more profitable once they paid themselves a market-based wage. And this is the power of behavioral economics. Matter of fact, if, if I would label what I do every day, I'm not an accountant, I'm a behavioral economist. I'm trying to find out what data I can use to get you to do what is in your best interest. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll use any tool at my disposal to do that. And and it matters. And and when you have to do mental Olympics to get to truth on the bottom line, 
you're just hurting yourselves and you're holding the company back. And so, um, and really, general accepted accounting principles or international financial reporting standards do not create truth in financial reporting. I, I, I would argue with all of my accounting peers of saying we just created a convoluted you know, bunch of mess, you know, with a lot of our standards of accounting. And I'll break any rule of accounting in my analytical design of, of business data to understand the truth of it. And and all you have to do is look to the supplemental data of publicly filed financial statements to start to understand that the reason why supplemental data exists is because they can present things in a non-GAAP, non-IVERS, you know, approach because there's industry standards of how things work. Think think of like cash on cash return, you know, in real estate. Well, you know, you're you're counting principal and interest as an expense in a cash on cash return calculation. Right. Those are the types of things that make sense to people. And right. the real estate industry has done perfectly well using cash on cash return concepts that have no basis in reality in general accepted accounting principles. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's really interesting because there is like this whole set of accounting principles that doesn't really make sense to the entrepreneurial numbers, which I know is what you talk a lot about in the book. I also, I want to dive back to that point of the behavioral economics and it makes sense what you're talking about, because if we're running our businesses, we're not paying ourselves an adequate Mm -hmm. salary, then we're almost really not focused on the real numbers of the business. And so what you're saying is basically once you start paying yourself the adequate salary, you're now focused on what the real return on your investment is. Mm -hmm. And do you see that people manage their numbers better and manage the business better once they have that spotlight on it? Well, you know, two things. I mean, one, I mean, I I make a point in the Simple Numbers 2.0 book that, you know, your business is the most valuable, highest returning asset in your hands that you'll ever own if it's run properly. And, and, but the problem is, is we don't have a good set of tools in basic accounting to understand what is the income in the numerator of the return equation and what is the denominator of capital in the equation. We do a horrible job. And most of my peers couldn't just explain capital if their life depended on it, unfortunately. And and I know they think they can, but I'm telling you, it goes right over the head, you know, of, of the people they're talking to. So they're not, they may think they understand it but they're not getting and you, you're not getting the point across and until the the person you're you're speaking to being the entrepreneur understands it then they get it and fortunately i, I get to chair a, a program at um at, at orton's uh business school for for the entrepreneurs organization it's called the eo at orton uh, finance and operations uh executive ed program and in there i give a lot of credit to david wessels who's the lead professor and uh, professor at Horton. You know, he's he really kind of taught me the the benefit of this return on invested capital calculation. Now, it's a common thing that's used in public companies. Got a little convoluted ways that they use it, but it turned me on to an idea that you know we don't really talk about that in private industry. And so I started studying it with the data we had access to with our client base, and really kind of developed my own range of thinking of understanding. What is the active capital assets minus liabilities in the business that the business needs to run on? Because there's there's all kinds of trash that are on your balance sheet of things that the business really doesn't need. You just used it to do it. And then what is the appropriate return? And I've settled into minimum acceptable returns, 50% year over year, every wow. year. And the the average uh, 100 companies that we use in our, our uh, economy tracking model um that average is generally stays around 75 percent return and some businesses that are you know don't require a lot of capital that are you know uh, very uh you know light on capital requirements i mean those businesses can be 100 percent return or better uh in in when they're operating profitably and it's like who wouldn't want a 75 percent cd right you know, and it's like why wouldn't you reinvest first in that cd i mean this is the thing that just gets me wired up is when investment advisors see cash on a company's financial statement they say oh that that's idle cash we need to invest that no you don't there's a certain there is certain excess cash potentially but there is cash that is active that keeps a company stable and that cash is returning the 75% return year in year out and why would you you know my 
quote that I'm famous for is, you know, you, you know, keep your cow healthy and milk it every day, or you can starve it and have one barbecue dinner. And so much of the financial advisory world is built around starving the cow. And yeah. it's like, why would you do that? And it yeah. just makes no sense. Because you're not going to get those returns of the stock market, which is a whole other topic we won't get into today. But yeah, like, well, and and it's really, it's short-term thinking. You know, yeah. it, it's people that, you know, think that they can get away with it and they think that they can highly leverage. And right now with interest rates up like they are, you know, people that uh, were relying on leverage are, are feeling the pain of the moment. Uh, and we teach full capitalization to our clients. And I got very few clients that are worried about interest right now because they got cash. And their businesses are operating, you know, they, they, they're, you know, most of them are down right now because the economy truly is in a recession. I don't care what the government's data says. Our data says we've been in a recession since Q4 of last year and continuing, um, you know, but at the end of the day, they're stable and they're profitable and they're cash flow generating. And they're not worried about a bank pulling their line of credit out from under. Right. And so that's how you wait out the marketplace until things stabilize. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so I want to kind of go uh, as a spinoff from that. So say you have a lot of cap capital in your business, you have excess cash. Now you want to grow, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. one of the things you talk about is labor productivity and how that's the key to profitability, but also right. simplifying human resource decisions, which is most of our growth decisions, right? You talk to entrepreneurs yeah. all the time. They're like, if I only had this one sales guy, then I could double the size of my business. Or if I hired another marketing person, I could, you know, really 10 exit. How do we simplify those HR decisions for growth? Yeah. So we're, we're known for a term we call LER, labor efficiency ratio. And there's, there's a total, there's an overall labor efficiency ratio, which is looking at gross margin revenue minus cost of goods sold, filter out all the pass-throughs that are material subcontractors, but not labor. You know, this is just the pure, I call gross margin in our definition, the pure economic top line of the business. That's the first dollar that can be spent internally. And one of the most fascinating things that I've seen as we've studied data from hundreds and hundreds of businesses over the last 20 years is there's one singular metric that applies to 90% of the businesses out there. And that's, I need $2 of gross margin for every dollar of labor, regardless of what that labor does. I don't care if it's direct labor. I don't care if it's sales labor. I don't care if it's executive labor. I don't care if it's the janitor. It counts. And I don't care if it's bonuses. I don't care if it's commissions. I, it, it matters. And, and so I just need two to one, you know, low of 1.9, you know, if you get to 2.1, you're probably what we say running hot, but 90% of the businesses out there run off of that. There's a handful that run skinnier than that. And, and it's, it's really because they're kind of pseudo staffing businesses. You got a lot of direct labor at a, like a, if you're a cleaning company, Mm -hmm. you, you know, you'd probably be at an overall LER of a one seven, maybe one six. And, you know, but if you really looked at it practically, you know, it, that, that labor that's in the field is very lightly managed. You're really just staffing a service and it's more about your management labor that it takes to manage that margin, you know, that's out there. But, and then, uh, for some reason, retail is about two and a half and hmm. distributors are about two and a half. But outside of probably those two types, those three types of examples, everybody else is really at a two to one. I mean, I, I'm just I'm just floored at how often I mean, it, it, it's there. Now, you can you can survive at a one eight. You're not going to thrive. You're, you're yeah. going to pay your salary. You're going to have some lo losing months. You're going to have some profitable months. Um, you know, but if if you get above a two one, you're stretching the hell out of everybody, and something's going to break. And and essentially, that's telling you that one. If I've got demand, feed you know feed the beast. You know, go ahead and add labor. Right. Uh, and and so, and I did a chapter for Vern Harness's book. Um, uh, scaling up. And in there, I talk about the baffle concept. Um, and, and essentially the idea being one way to kind of use the labor efficiency ratio as a governor is you drive to a, say, to get to a 2.0 labor efficiency, and then you open up the salary cap in essence and say, you know, what is the labor that I need that things are, I need to backfill. It could be management labor, could be direct labor, could be some of both. 
and I feel it, but I don't add any more that pushes me below a run rate of one nine. And then I grow back to a two and, and you go back and forth between those two. And, and to us, I mean, that's been, I mean, it, it's not sexy. It's not something that's going to get you on the front of, of, of a business, you know, Forbes magazine, but you survive. And, you know, and, and I'm really kind of taken by uh, one of the books I've really been enamored with lately is this book by Annie Duke called Quit. And uh, she's the, the famous poker player. And, and in that book, you know, it talks about, you know, she tells a lot of these behavioral economic stories, you know, that, that I'd read in other books as well. But she added a few that I had not read. But, you know, things like you need guidelines that say, you know, no go zone. And she, you know, she talks about the, you know, the, the guides to climbing Mount Everest and even one of the famous guides, most experienced that knew the rule. If you don't get to this point by this time of day, you turn around no matter how long you've trained. And the one time the guy broke the rule, he died. That's business. And, and we see that in labor efficiency. And so the idea is, you know, business is a series of bets. Um, and most people bet through their P&L rather than on their balance sheet with buying equipment or buying, building a plant. Or, you know, and there are some businesses that do that, and we have clients that do that. You know, but the average business is making a bet typically in one of two places. I'm either adding labor that I don't fully need at the moment, and I've got to sell to fill it up, or I've got a surge in marketing spend to try to drive business, and I've got to hold it accountable to say, did it work? And do yeah. I stop, pull back, and, and redeploy? And I would say, given the disruption of the market in at the moment, we've got more people rethinking both of those choices right now than, than in quite a long time. Marketing is really going in a lot of different directions right now where people are cutting spending in one place and redeploying. And we're fans of effective marketing spend. I, I, I want people to spend money on marketing, but I want you to spend it on something that works. And if it doesn't work, quit, stop it, do, do something else. But a lot of people fail to deploy good tracking and accountability measures. And even the people that have good accountability measures, the behavioral aspect that they've made an investment. I, I was talking to a real estate agent the other day that, that had channels that he demonstrably showed in his own data that he's losing money betting in these three or four different channels. And I had to really push him to stop spending in those channels and deploy it in the channels he was making money from. Yeah. yeah. And, but it's, but it, it is that psychological impact of sunk cost. I've, I've made this bet. Yes. It, it's going to work. It's going to turn around. Yeah. It hadn't turned around in two years, three years. <laughs> yeah. it, it ain't, it's nothing magical is going to happen tomorrow to make it work. Yeah. And, but that that's the battle that I, I and I think this is the reason why I think entrepreneurs earn every dime of profit they get, because I'm telling you, it is a deep, dark place that many of us live in. And, you know, and and the average rank and file employee just does not get it. And, you know, but the, you know, the entrepreneurs are, you know, we're, we're not going to get the love, you know, from people from from creating the market. But that's my people. I mean, I, I, I'm an entrepreneur myself, as well as, you know, serving the needs of the entrepreneurs. And, and, and I, I think they just they just need that clarity to know how to make the, those better decisions and make them optimized. Yeah. Well, and that's what I love about your book. And every time I hear you talk, Greg, is that it's changing the position of numbers, which are not a favorite of entrepreneurs to give us useful guardrails, metrics, tools, rules to follow in our business that sometimes takes that pressure off the decision-making, right? Yeah. If you can, like using LER as an example, if you have this range and you know, you know, I've got to stay between 1.9 and 2.1, then you can just project if I hire that sales guy, is it going to put me below 1.9 or am I not quite there yet? And right. it's actually relieving in a way to say, here's this rule that I just have to follow. And I don't have to go into the deep, dark place in my head of, should I do it? Should I not? What if I don't do it? And I'll just follow the rule that we've set for ourselves. Well, and, and I think, you know, kind of what we do and as we consult with clients, they l rely on us, one, to be that voice of reason. I'm not married to, to, the, to the business. I want to see it to succeed. And there's definitely, we have a vested interest in, in them succeeding. 
but I'm not in the day to day. I'm not emotionally tied up, you know, to, to what they're doing, but they also need somebody who can really take the data and, and control it and keep it in context rather than using it. You know, you know, a lot of internal data production is somebody really using pieces of data to prove a point and it's just not a valid argument. Right. And, and so a lot of times we get to play data judge and, yeah. You know, and I and and I think you know it's it's a good role for us to be because it it gives the decision makers confidence that okay we're looking at actionable data, every and we validated it reasonably well enough that we can take this course of action and we know what we're doing. Um, you know, not we're, we're not blessed with access to data all the time that, that we'd love to have, but you know, one of the things that. I'm a fan of is, you know, people think, well, okay, I need to get my data cleaned up. Not really. I mean, probably one of our best skill sets is we can make sense out of bad data if you just give me enough of it. If you give me enough data across time, it data has a natural movement to it. And if you know how to control large amounts of data and keep it valid, you can make the biggest issue a lot of times is timing. You know, I got revenue in one period and cost in another period. And how do I get that synced up? And we've got using rolling data techniques and just sometimes abject corrections where you know, you know what the cause of it was. And we work outside of their accounting system with that data model. It gives us the freedom to fix things. I don't have to charge them a massive amount of money to fix historical data, which is usually worthless, is never needed. But you can then say from this point forward, we now know how to how to tag, how to code, how how should we point things, and we know the relationship of data and how it should happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good um, intro for my last question for you, Greg. Before we wrap up, is just you've imparted so much great advice to our listeners. I'm sure some of them are wondering how can I get in touch with Greg's team and learn about working with you guys in the future? Um, how can that happen? Who can they reach out to if they want to learn more about your team and working together? Uh, I mean, you know, certainly you can reach out to me directly. I'm probably one of the easiest people in the world to find. There's not too many Greg Crabtrees out there, especially that, that do what I do. So I'm um, pretty easy to find, uh, but simple numbers, CRI.com is the, the, the website uh, for, uh, for the consulting practice that's part of, of CRI. Uh, you can reach out to me directly, greg.crabtree at uh, simplenumberscri.com. I'm easily found on LinkedIn. Uh, a lot of people reach out and connect to me there first, and then we we can then follow up via email. Uh, so any of those channels, you know, certainly will uh, we, we, we get you to me. But like I said, uh, if somebody says they can't find me, they didn't try very hard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we're also going to drop all of that contact information to our show notes. So you can click directly in the show notes straight to Greg's email LinkedIn. So super easy. Yeah. Um, Greg, thank you so much for being on the deal board. We enjoyed having you and uh, really look forward to hearing more from hopefully some of our listeners that end up working okay. together with you and improving the profitability of their business. Good deal. Appreciate it. Anytime. Hey, Jessica, you know what time it is? Money time? Almost. It's time for listing of the week. Hey, welcome back, everybody. It is listing of the week. And we are talking to Jonathan Che from Transworld Business Brokers, Transworld Business Brokers, Transworld Business Advisors of Central Oregon. And Jonathan, you have a really good listing. We do. We have a listing for 1.5 million. Seller discretionary earnings is about 550. It is a roofing company mm. that uh, has been around for 20 plus years. Nice. The owners are leaving to pursue other interests, uh, but they've got a management team in place, turnkey uh, in a great growing market in Central Oregon. And uh, we're excited uh, to present uh, this great long established uh, company. That sounds like a great opportunity. And if I know anything about Bend, it's still growing and there's like gonna be plenty of opportunity for a roofing company, correct? And that is right. They're having their best year ever. People keep moving in from the big cities to yeah, sure. <laughs> Central Oregon. You know? So, uh, and, you know, there's a lot of wealth in Central Oregon. So right. um, uh, that spending hasn't stopped or exactly. even slowed down. Well, it sounds like a great way to make some money. So give Jonathan a call. What's the best way to get in touch with you? You could call me on my cell phone at 541-213-0234 
or email me at jchoe at tworld.com. Excellent. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks Great for having listing. me. Thanks for tuning into the show today. If you like the podcast, share it with your friends on social media. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcasting app. If you have questions, would like to appear, or have suggestions for topics for the show, get in contact with us through our website, thedealboardpodcast.com.